Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, many thanks as well to uh, MLI, my co-panelists, uh, for this uh, for this topic today. Uh, it is, uh, as Brian said, it is a very uh, it's a very vital issue. It's one that is extremely uh, complex, and that's part of the uh, issue that I'd like to address today. Um, to sort of preface my remarks, I'll say right off the top, uh, I've been a, an intelligence, security intelligence practitioner for almost 30 years. Um, I'm doing now the security risk uh, business uh, with respect to both uh, advanced analytics and uh, uh, helping clients better mitigate risks uh, because I believe that in most cases that's a very attainable objective in terms of managing the things that threaten or that are pose a risk to any particular organization, be it public or private. Um, yes, I've been hawkish on some issues of late. I've spoke out on the Huawei issue, but I've also um, uh, been somewhat, uh, I hope, balanced in the sense that uh, some threats are, uh, are quite uh, direct, uh, they're quite acute, and they're quite uh, easy to develop uh, mitigation strategies in terms of uh, public policy or whether it's a, a governance issue for an organization. Others, unfortunately, are much more translucent, uh, they're amorphous, and they're much more difficult to get your minds around. And I think there's probably no better example than a state-owned enterprise or the, the SOE. So um, I will deal with a couple of elements that stay within, of course, my, my purview, which is really security, although it, it is very difficult to uh, distinguish or to make some very clear sense of why is a state-owned enterprise a threat to national security. In fact, in a previous life, as the Assistant Director of CSIS uh, on the intelligence front, where we managed the knowledge piece of the organization, I'd sit with these strategic analysts and I've asked that very same question because I knew the boss, Dick Fadden, would be asking me, uh, why are state-owned enterprises a threat to national security? Well, it's, it's complicated. Uh, it's not easy, and I'll come back and hopefully illustrate uh, why I believe there are some elements that are distinctly threat-related uh, and they have very strong threat characteristics. Uh, but um, before I do, let me also sort of balance off some of the ideas because um, I recognize in my position that too many practitioners in, from my background have found reasons why certain things shouldn't occur. Or the advice would be best to avoid that risk because it's too complicated, it's too difficult. And that's not at all my purpose for today. I get that CEOs and Canadians understand that this, there's an imperative to engage China. In China, we must engage in terms of our, our future economic uh, uh, situation, in terms of our ability to compete as a nation, but also it's just, it's just the way it is. We cannot move away from things that are difficult to understand or difficult to manage. So we must execute on that front, and um, even though in this case, I guess the, uh, the issue becomes to, comes down to what exactly are we concerned about and what is it about this new authoritarian style capitalism that makes us uncomfortable? And why is it, I think, probably best represented with respect to the state-owned enterprise? Uh, the, the short answer to that, or the short advice would be, if I had that question posed to me immediately, my answer is, you must engage, but do so with eyes wide open. And that is the best, simplest advice that I can propose. But let me now drill down to what's really at issue. And part of that question, and, and referring back to my old profession, would be is um, what is the threat from the PRC, the People's Republic of China, intelligence service? Because to me, that's at the core of understanding what is at issue with respect to SOEs, or state-owned enterprises. Well, first of all, the PRCIS, as we call it, the intelligence service, and the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, are, have one purpose in life, and that's to serve the party, the party as in the state. And uh, it's that simple. Uh, there's no distinction and there's no separation or division of labor or division of responsibility. And in my view, state-owned enterprises do so equally. They have the same, uh, the same marching orders and essentially the same mandate or mission to follow through, but with some important distinctions, and I'll, and I'll come back to that. Some of the economic priorities that the PRCIS would pursue include uh, aerospace, agriculture, uh, oil and gas, any extractive minerals, uh, for example, uh, manufacturing technology, and so on. Uh, these are intended to facilitate or benefit Chinese-based industries. So that, that in itself represents a state moving at the behest of an enterprise, which again creates a very, very murky and difficult to manage environment from a security or threat perspective. Which brings us to the part that I've always felt in looking at that particular threat actor is that it's always been a very persistent and a very prolific threat. And it's done so why? Well, because it involves multiple, uh, multiple attack vectors. It is cyber, 
Absolutely. Uh, cyber in a very big way and a very successful cyber approach. It's also with respect to um, what I used to call, some of my analysts used to bristle at the, at the reference, but I like to refer to it as mass line collection, where there's a great number of people who move forward through delegation visits, through engagements, and collect little bits and pieces of the information which are then that later put together by the tens of thousands of analysts that are available for the enterprise. And it's also about um, the dangers of losing intellectual property through joint ventures, and that's another big piece of that. Well, let me speak to uh, some of the examples then. We've had the, uh, the BHP Billiton example from about uh, two or three years ago, wherein it was reported uh, a number of um, uh, parties to the whole program, wherein a, an Australian-based company tried to purchase uh, uh, the Saskatchewan Potash Corporation, through that, as reported in the media, a number of pings through cyber occurred. And there were a number of efforts to acquire insider knowledge on the deal. And it wasn't just the obvious uh, place where they would attack. It was law firms, stock exchange, and a number of other things, all intended to be able to inform those who are assisting a state or enterprise who is then attempting to acquire the Saskatchewan Potash Corporation. The recent stories that emerged out of Nortel from the former IT security head saying that, yes, Nortel probably fell for a number of reasons. It fell probably through market forces, uh, maybe management issues, and so on, but essentially we got done. Somebody ate our lunch, and all that lunch was really essentially some of the best intellectual property available to the telecommunications industry. If you go back further in time, I think back at the example of the uh, can-do slowpoke reactor and the efforts to create a new, uh, very efficient, uh, low-cost device that ended up being uh, and this is long before the existence of state-owned enterprises as we know them today, were then shown to a number of delegations from China that eventually um, fast forward a number of years and the Chinese built their own version of that particular unit at a much lower cost and basically put that project, um, for that Canadian project, back on the shelf and never really reached the market as it should have. Significant uh, financial impact, but one with very strong security links to it. So then what's, let me now take you back a little bit towards the nature of state-owned enterprise and what do we mean by that and why is it again a security risk? Well, it is that new capitalism I mentioned. It certainly is um, embedded with a, a number of significant complexities. Uh, mostly what bothers me when I think about why is it different, why is it different from a Western European uh, company engaging in the effort to sort of acquire a Canadian company, well, there are different rules. There, there are different elements to the organization. It certainly doesn't have the same boards of directors. It certainly doesn't have um, the same sort of checks and balances. Yes, in some ways, and I'll, I'll speak to Sino directly, yes, it's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Yes, the international agency, energy agency says that it is uh, the subject of PRC investment, but it is not state run. Uh, I, however, would not be that categorical. Um, is it reasonable? The question I, in fact, I would ask my CSIS analysts uh, the following sorts of questions. Uh, is it reasonable to call it opaque? Absolutely. Uh, are there normal or typical rules of corporate governance? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, what about the rule of law? Uh, do they follow the rule of law? Yes, but the answer would be not as we, we know it. I think that's what I've concluded. Is there a certain level of corporate transparency? Well, yes, but only enough to meet regulatory requirements in my experience and from my readings. But above all, it's really about the one-party state and it's about a centrally controlled economy that manages the activities of state-owned enterprise. And also, it's a place where I think in terms of understanding distinctions between a purchase by a multinational corporation versus state-owned enterprise that profit is not a core driver for the organization. So, on the security front, Canadians really have to ask themselves a couple of basic questions. How much of that type of investment would we think is appropriate in strategic areas of our economy, such as oil and gas? CNUC, Sinopec, PetroChina, and other subsidiaries have reportedly invested about $30 billion in uh, Canadian-controlled uh, uh, um, organizations or enterprise. Again, is that an alarming number? Well, it all depends. It depends on which percentage of it is within the marketplace. It also what's behind those particular organizations. And again, most of them do resolve back to state-owned enterprise when it comes to Chinese investment. 
As Diane Francis recently said, there also seems to be an alarming trend towards picking off trophy assets, which I think is very interesting. Another uh, sort of another pattern piece that people in the security intelligence business would look for anomalies to be able to, to better understand these things. So um, there's also a couple of other little quick trends that I'll throw, I'll throw out there in my last couple of minutes, but I, I've often thought about the African experience. I've thought about Africa in terms of what happened to its economy through a significant Chinese investment and looking at the game plan of acquisition. Uh, there's also the question about what are these companies after? Is it an oil play or is it access to technology which is very, very relevant to Canada's success in the oil and gas industry? I think Orcrude's technology from Opti, which is a, a Nexon company, is a, is a good example of that leading edge technology. So let me now speak quickly then to the core issue of the security threat itself. Generally, the CSIS public report has linked SOEs to intel agencies and hostile governments. Therefore, in the view of CSIS, they represent a threat to national security. What does that all mean? And now CSIS did not identify China specifically, but I am. Um, it, it means that supporting state requirements um, for military or for security intelligence purposes or the SOE is being supported by them. It's a very, very comfortable relationship which would make most Canadians uncomfortable. There's also the issue about sovereignty. Are they truly subject to Canadian law? And what does that mean with respect to rules on foreign interference? What about the, is this going to be a state-to-state -state relationship or is this a state-to-corporation relationship? Uh, in my view as well, I think comes with this whole package of state owned enterprises, the issue of potentially significant foreign interference. Uh, I think the uh, Sinopec claim recently that it has sovereign immunity in Alberta and in an Alberta court um, is a good example of their perhaps intellectual flexibility on those issues. Uh, finally, I think geopolitically, there's Syria, North Korea, Iran. How will this affect our sovereign policy with respect to security decisions? With the international community decisions on sanctions against Iran be thwarted by a state-owned enterprise that's operating in Canada but owned overseas. So unfortunately, there's more, there are more questions than are answers, and uh, it's a difficult set of issues to get our mind around. But I will say this. There'll be a decision soon through Cabinet. Uh, I can't give you the evidence. This is not what I do. I'm an intelligence analyst that deals with all of the available facts and produce a cogent analysis to say this is what I believe is that issue. Um, we'll have to sort of at least think of nothing else that this brings a very, very new reality to Canadian business and Canadian opportunities and one where the risks are very, very significant. So I'll leave it to uh, the political side to manage those significant political risks, but I at least for now want to identify what I believe are some of the, the major security considerations in that decision-making process. So I look forward to the Q&A.